Hi everybody, welcome back to our lectures on polymers. In this episode, we will now talk about polymer nanoparticles. Before we do this, let us briefly recap what we learned last week. And by doing so, let me just put up this slide that we had at the very beginning of our lecture. Now, where I said that in order to understand how we can make polymers or make polymer products, we need to kind of go all the way back from understanding material properties, understanding the physics of single polymers, and understanding the chemistry on how to make um, polymer polymeric materials. And now, in a sense, we went full circle and we are about to cross this last boundary from materials to processes. So in the last two lectures, we talked about material properties, saw the difference between amorphous materials, elastomeric materials, which are slightly cross-linked amorphous uh, polymers, and semi-crystalline materials. And now, this polymer nanoparticles that we want to focus on today is already kind of a first type of processing where we try to get our normal polymers into a very small dispersed form. And as you will see, as we, what we will discuss, is that this can be actually quite useful for applications. No? And from there on, we really transition into the, the realm of polymer processing, polymer applications to see what we can do with polymers. Okay, so what do we want to learn today? The objectives here is, first, we want to briefly discuss why should we care about polymer nanoparticles? Now we, we discuss applications, maybe see what is special about them, and so on and so forth. Then I want to do a short recap, and I'm, uh, I'm, I understand that this is not really part of the core curriculum of this course, but it's important to understand why polymer nanoparticles need to be stabilized, or what happens if you don't stabilize them properly. From there, we will then look into really the synthesis of polymer nanoparticles. And then we can, once we have understood this, we will discuss some special architecture, so how to make more complex polymer nanoparticles. And then finally, we want to kind of close up this lecture by a look at, if you want chemical engineering aspects, to uh, reveal the kinetics of such um, polymerization in this first phase. And then you will see a surprise that we can overcome a dilemma that we were facing in our free radical polymerization. Okay, but before we um, really dig into this, let's start with the first chapter or the first uh, part of this lecture. Why do we need polymer nanoparticles? So now if you think for yourself at home, where in your life, where have you seen or found or maybe used polymer nanoparticles? Take a minute and try to consider. So what this boils down to is essentially what are applications of polymer nanoparticles. Once we understand this, I will then tell you how we can actually make them. But let's first look at why we should care about polymer nanoparticles. Well, the very first application of polymer nanoparticles, and I would think at least from everyday life, by far the most widespread one, is in paints. So I call this thin film technology, which sounds a little bit more fancy, but what I mean is paints. And what you see here is a paint that you may use to um, whatever color your, your walls, for example. And here you see a glue that has um, a suspiciously white color. And you see this is, happens to be a green color, but this may as well be white. You see it's, trans it's not transparent, but it has these kind of opaque characteristics. So a typical uh, paint that you use on a wall is known as a dispersion paint, Dispersionsfarbe in German. And this already gives us a hint about what this actually is. So now if you take a look around in your whatever living room or study room, um, most likely your walls will be white, they may also be colored, but generally the paint that you put on the walls, think about what this may contain. So clearly, if it has a color, it will contain a pigment, you know, whatever that will be. If it's white, it will also contain a pigment, but one that simply scatters light. And this scattering is typically done by titanium dioxide particles, simply because they have a high refractive index and therefore very efficiently scatter visible light. So that means light that comes through your window will be scattered from the wall, and overall, since the light that comes in is white, the appearance of your wall is white. And the same is, of course, true for any paint you put on your whatever table, chair, and so on and so forth. All right, so now think about titanium dioxide particles. Now this will feel a little bit like glass particles. They're very small, so hard. And if I just try to put them on a the wall, they will either directly fall down, or at least once I start to touch them, I will all uh, remove these particles. So what we need to add there is some kind of a binder to ensure that our uh, coating or our pigment stays on the wall. And this is where the polymer particles come into place. 
Now you may say, well, we can just simply use a polymer, and that's, that's perfectly fine, but typical polymers are not water soluble. And they are soluble in organic solvents, something like maybe chloroform, or if it's really worth toluene or benzene. And now you can imagine if you try to paint your um, living room wall with a, a paint that contains chloroform, then it will not take very long until you either go unconscious or fall down or get severe headaches because all your, your apartment will be saturated with chloroform, forms, uh, chloroform um, gas. And this is, of course, not something that you uh, would like to have and it would be uh, extremely toxic um, and, and dangerous. So you need, really need to go away from organic solvents if you were to use these paints in an indoor setting and not made in a special whatever factory or so. So now this dilemma um, that, that we're facing here is that we need to have a polymer that is not water soluble because the water soluble uh, to use as a binder in a paint would be a bit pointless because once you start to, to pour water on your wall or maybe if it's an outdoor wall or whatever, then it will directly fl uh, fly away because the polymer will dissolve. So it needs to be an, an insoluble polymer, but we also cannot use an organic solvent, otherwise we will poison ourselves when we paint it. So what to do? And this is where the dispersion paint comes into place. A dispersion, by definition, and now if, if you don't know this, either um, look up in, in other lectures or maybe just Google it briefly, is a two-component system that contains small solid particles dispersed in a continuous um, phase. And in our case, what we have in our paint, you can also draw this briefly, in our dispersion paint, water, which is the continuous phase. So this is what you have in your bucket. And then we have our pigment that we need to either color the wall or make it white. So let's whatever, make it a rectangle. And we have this first polymer nanoparticles and they will act as the binder. Now I do not want to go into detail here how this exactly works because this is what we will discuss next week but very briefly kind of as a sneak preview you start to paint this we have a droplet of water that contains your materials and when it dries out you form a solid film that may contain your pigment. So the polymer particles form a thin film, and this is the binder that really, if you want, glues your material to the wall. How exactly this magic works to come from here to here, we will, as I said, discuss in detail in the next hour. So the same is true for a lot of glues. So if you have glue, for example, a wood glue, in, in German, Holzleim. This is also something that if you, if you buy one of these, it doesn't smell tremendously like solvent, so it's also water-based. So very often it's also marked as water-based or solvent-free. And what you have here is simply water and polymer particles. And in this case, of course, the concentration is fairly high because you want to make sure it sticks well. But now if you start kind of gluing your two pieces of wood together, you add this kind of mixture. 
this is the glue. And as it dries out, again, these particles form a continuous thin film. So here, this is wood, for example. And then these two pieces will be very accurately glued together because these particles here really solidify or form a continuous solid film, which holds everything together. So I would say the majority of, of glues, and especially paints, are based on polymer particles, especially the ones that you can use in the inside. Now, there's, of course, also different types of paints that, um, that may, may use dissolved polymers, but they typically smell very nasty and are fairly toxic. So this is really a huge market and, of course, a huge area of application. And it can also, you see here, latex dispersion paints, adhesives, so whatever sticky surfaces. But also, it can be a bit more fancy if you think about printable electronics. They very often also use polymer particles either as active materials, semiconducting, conducting polymers, or as binder materials, as sealants, and so on and so forth. So also in really modern technologies, modern thin film technologies, you find these dispersions. Okay, so what else? This is, of course, a fairly big business. But if you think in a completely different direction, then you can think about cosmetics or consumer goods and even food. And very often, of course, there you want to make sure that your polymer is non-toxic and biocompatible, maybe biodegradable or even bioderived. But if you can do this, then you can use polymer particles very often or very efficiently in such applications. Now, if you think a little bit about where this could be useful to use. Well, very generally, we already discussed that hydrogels or hydrogel polymers can be used to stabilize food or to whatever, make food. Don't think about jello or gummy bears and so on. And now, of course, if you make these smaller, then you can use this to um, control the viscosity of your food or um, uh, stuff like this. So this is one application. Um, in cosmetics, very often what you want to do is bind water to your material so that after application your skin becomes moist and then looks much better and less wrinkly. Also here, of course, you use a lot of hydrogels or hydrogel particles. And um, perfume test stripes that do not age is also um, um, a fairly interesting application of such polymer uh, particles. So in this case, I think all of you know this, if you go to um, a drugstore or maybe buy um, a fashion magazine, then sometimes you have these strips and if you, if you pull on them or if you, if you rub on them, then they start to smell like a perfume, you know, to, to show you how this perfume would smell like if you buy it. Now the question is what happens here? Well, in this case, we have fairly complex requirements. We want to make sure that the perfume stays in your material for at least a fairly long time, because at least you need to buy this magazine, you bring it home, maybe it doesn't, uh, don't read it directly on the first day, and eventually you still want to be able to smell it. So normal, of course, perfume contains a lot of very volatile um, fragments or very, uh, very volatile um, uh, flagrants, and that uh, leads to this thing to to stop smelling very quickly. So we need to shield it from evaporation. But then again, we want to make sure that once I start rubbing on it, or pushing it or pulling it or whatever, then it will decompose and release the smell. And what you can do is you use a capsule. And here you have your perfume. And this one here is a polymer capsule. And now, if you manage to, to synthesize or to fabricate something like this, then the perfume will stay in there for a fairly long time because the capsule is not penetrable to the fragrance. But now, when I, when I push, or wrap or whatever, or touch it, then I will break open this polymer shell and the perfume 
and the perfume goes out. And then, of course, if I stand there, I can smell it and get the test or so. Okay, so these are applications of polymer nanoparticles more in the area, if you want, of cosmetics, consumer goods, and so on. Good, so anything else? If we continue to think about where else could we find polymer nanoparticles? Well, one important consideration is in chemical engineering, where we generally, and why is that? Because we discussed quite in detail that polymerizations, very often, especially radical polymerizations, are exothermic reactions. And if we don't pay attention, we risk a Tromstoff effect or kind of an auto acceleration of our reaction. And this leads to um, problems because your reactor can explode. So a good idea would be if we had a mean to remove the heat that is uh, produced in, in this reaction directly while we make the polymers. And if we make a polymerization in small particles, then we can directly, you know, if this is our mini reactor, our droplet of monomer, then the heat can directly be dissipated by the water phase. And this is, of course, a tremendous advantage because you don't need to uh, be careful that your factor will not explode because you have a very efficient cooling system directly within your system. And then secondly, as we already discussed, a lot of products are actually needed as polymer particles. Think about the paint again. So you don't really need to process it any, fur any further. You, if you manage to do a synthesis like this, you can pretty much directly fit it into tubes, add your pigment, and that's about it. So this is really the advantage or can be a huge advantage um, of such a polymerization in dispersion or in a confinement. And as an additional gimmick, we will see that we will overcome this dilemma of the radical polymerization, that we can either get a fast reaction or we can get long polymer chains. But stay tuned for this. This is something we will discuss a little bit later. OK, what, what else? Something that I like is what we typically call simple nanotechnology. So one can realize that if you manage to create defined structures on a surface, or maybe also defined structures in a material, you can create functional materials, simply because the structure will determine how the material behaves. And this can lead to structural color. This is something that you see very often in nature. Think about butterflies or birds or beetles. Very often, their really beautiful colors do not come from pigments or from, from dyes, but from an internal structure within that animal. The same is true for repellent surfaces. If you think about the lotus leaf, they are simply the water repellency comes from a very rough and um, hierarchically structured surface coating. You can also control of friction. This is something that, for example, snakes do. You can make antibacterial materials. If you tune your structures correctly, then cells or bacteria cannot adhere very, very well to the surface. And there is tons of other applications where really a structure creates a function. And that brings us to the problem that we actually need to create such, uh, such structures. And a fairly convenient way to do this is using small polymer nanoparticles, no? because you can synthesize them very cheaply, and pretty much everybody can do this. And if you have this under control, then you can control their assemblies and then form either two-dimensional layers, which will give surface coatings. You can, can uh, form thin films. Here you have a nanopore with thin films. Or you can form super particles where your structure is really encoded in a bigger uh, particulate structure itself. This is something that is very close to my heart. That's what we do in our, um, uh, in, in our group or in my group. And this alone may look beautiful, but doesn't really tell you anything. But if I now switch the slide, then you will see that these surfaces, if you look at them from much further away, have very beautiful, for example, optical properties. Now you see here, this is something that also has optical properties, but this is mainly made to be very repellent. So this is, a, if you want, a synthetic lotus leaf. Here you see that we have um, fairly beautiful and fairly intense colors that simply come from the periodicity of the stacked polymeric material. And here we have our super particles that also work as color pigments. And in this case, it works from structural color. And all these applications simply come from defining the structure and this is something we can use very well doing, uh, using polymeric particles. OK, one final application. This is maybe a little bit more in the future, at least partially. And this is biomedical applications. That's something that we already discussed a very little bit in the very beginning of our lecture. But let me just re recap this, why I think this is really an important field of applications. So the idea is 
that we can either use polymer nanoparticles, maybe in a simple way, because they are biocompatible. Now think about biodevised polymers, polylactic acid, maybe alginate, maybe uh, cellulose, um, starch, and so on. So they are non-toxic, you can eat them, and that's pretty much what you do on a daily basis. And that allows you to um, encapsulate materials that may be less biodegradable or um, maybe too small or can be uh, decomposed too easily and shield them from our body response. And this is actually already done in imaging facilities uh, when you use, for example, iron oxide nanoparticles. So they can be used to enhance contrast in um, magnetic resonance imaging, so MRI technology. Um, and, and there, uh, you need a good contrast in order for the doctor to see you know, what is the problem or to see your body. And if you use these um, contrast agents, often they are coated in a polymeric film to allow them to, to circulate longer and to control their behavior in the body. Okay, and even more, if you want futuristic application, is drug delivery. And this kind of plays on a controlled release of a functional drug at the location where you want. So you can picture, for example, you... Uh, you have cancer or um, um, have a problem with, with your body. Let's say I have a cancer for simplicity here in my arm. And now the typical treatment would be I take, um, uh, a th undergo a chemotherapy. That means I swallow or I get injected very toxic chemicals. And the idea is to pretty much bombard the entire body with these toxic chemicals, with the, the idea or the, the, the rational that the tumor cells, because they grow faster, they tend to contain more holes, will get a higher dose of this toxic material and then die earlier. And this actually works, but you see how people look like after they underwent uh, chemotherapy. It works under the, with, you pay a high price for that because your whole body suffers from this. So a much more elegant idea would be, of course, to take exactly the same toxic drugs, but now shield them from the body, similar to this biocompatible uh, imaging agents, and let them circulate around and find the tumor. So either maybe via magnetic stimuli, maybe via um, receptors that are on the tumor surface that can be put on the surface of the nanoparticles, or via any other kind of, kind of means. And if you manage to do this, let's say, no, I get this injected, now it flows all over my body, and here's my tumor, and after a while, all these materials will be accumulated within the tumor. So now, if I manage to do this, then I just, and that's a big just, need to release the payload, whatever I have in the particles, right at the destination where it's supposed to work. If I manage to do this again, then of course I have all the toxic materials being released straight within the tumor cells. They die with a much higher efficiency and leave your entire body much more kind of um, inert or much more uncompromised by their treatment. And this would of course be a huge promise and a huge uh, success uh, for mankind, but you can also imagine it's not entirely easy and it's much, much um, more complex than I'm just you know, standing here and telling you. And what you need for this are a lot of different materials. So here's the idea. You now you have your, for example, your nanoparticle here. Here's a payload and then you degrade it and the payload comes out here. But in order to do this, you need to make sure that your particles remain stable in the body. You need to make sure that your drug is within your particles. You need to make sure that something guides the particles into the region of interest, so into the tumor cells. And then you need to make sure, or you need to somewhat ensure, that whatever is in the particles, this payload, is very efficiently released at this final destination. And this is something that, if you want, we can discuss a little bit more in our uh, Zoom meeting discussion, but it's, of course, a huge challenge that draws a lot of researchers, and it's a very important challenge. And this is what polymer scientists, or a lot of polymer scientists, nowadays work on. Okay, so much to the applications of polymer nanoparticles. Now I want to move on and just kind of give you a brief recap on the stability of nanoparticles. And there's a big problem. Let's say we managed to do, to synthesize nanoparticles. Say they are two kind of polymer particles, here shown in gray. And if I just leave them in my water continuous phase, very quickly they will aggregate. So they will form uh, dimers, trimers, and then big um, agglomerates, and then precipitates, which, by the way, is a huge problem in the body because that means you will clog your, your um, uh, blood streams and then get whatever, a heart attack and so on. So this is absolutely must be prevented. And the first question to you would be, why do they actually um, agglomerate? What's the problem here? 
And for, for those of you that, that study here at the University of Erlangen, you may recall from my lecture at, uh, of the Grenzflächen in der Verfahrenstechnik in the colloidal section that we discussed this. So the big problem here is van der Waals forces. This guy here, van der Waals, got a Nobel Prize for discovering that pretty much all matter attracts um, each other. So molecules, particles, well, anything is composed of atoms or molecules, but any uh, microscopic or molecular microscopic or microscopic object really is attracted to each other because of van der Waals forces. Very widely spread, very ubiquitous in nature, and what you see here is that these formulas that he derived for molecules, they always have this very characteristic um, distance dependence from one to the distance here r to the power of six. That means it's very short range. The molecules need to be very close so that they, they sense, oh, here's a second molecule, and then they aggregate. If you then do the math and you calculate how these forces interact between two spheres, then you will find that the potential here goes with one over r. And that is actually a very significant long-range potential. And that means that a particle that swims around in this water dispersion will start to sense a second particle from fairly far away. Once they sense each other, each other they will attract, and then they will aggregate. And that is a big problem. Well, and those of you that followed this lecture will already know the solution. We need to do something that counteracts these van der Waals forces, or that prevents the particles from actually coming close enough so that they start to sense each other. And what you typically do is you introduce a stabilizer. And this can either be electrostatics, so that means you bring charges to the particle surface, or this can be steric effects. And in this case, you put polymer chains on the particle surface. Both have this effect that the particles cannot come close, and that means that um, they remain stable in dispersion. And this can be summarized by the so-called DLVO theory, um, discovered by uh, Deja Green, Landau, Bebe, and Overbeck, hence the name DLVO. Now this is the, the first letters of their names. And they came up with an interpretation of the total interaction potential of two colloidal particles. And what you can recognize here is this is a functional expression of electrostatic repulsion, very characteristic with this exponential decay. And this is the functional expression of van der Waals attraction. You see with this one over, in this case d, one over distance of the particles um, uh, uh, kind of functional form. Okay, and if you look at this, then you see, and again, I'm not going to go into detail, but the total interaction potential here u or v or whatever, here's zero, uh, as a function of d, which is the distance is composed of, let's see, of this van der Waals attraction. And this goes with 1 over d. And on top here, we have our electrostatic repulsion. And this is this decays with an exponential function. And if you sum these together, then you get the total interaction potential. What you typically also assume is that there is a, a hard barrier here that when the particle are in contact, they cannot overlap any further. And then the entire potential looks like this. And what we see is that here, or maybe we start here, we have a minimum here. meaning that the particles would most preferably be in very close proximity, and that is the, this agglomerated state. But we also have an energy barrier here. And this energy barrier caused by this repulsion 
prevents the particles from coming in close contact. So that's the trick. That's why you need the charges or the polymers on the surface to build up this energy barrier to prevent particles from aggregation. Okay, as I said, this is not the topic. You can have a secondary minimum here, which is called the flocculation minimum, and so on and so forth. But just to give you the gist, we need to have charges here. Need to, to work against van der Waals forces. Okay, so you also see this. Where's my laser pointer? Ah, here. So this is what you see here as well. Okay, so now we can, having considered these things, we can finally move to approaches on how we can synthesize particles. And before we do this, let me just clean up a little bit. And you can, if you want, already think about what strategies you could think or you have in mind to make such particles. Okay, so how do we synthesize polymer nanoparticles? Generally, there's a lot of different approaches, and I want to highlight two of them, which I think are probably the most widespread ways, uh, widespread ways on how to do this. And very conceptually, you can think about two strategies. You either make droplets of your monomer in a solution, in water or whatever, and then you polymerize within these droplets, or you can try to somewhat get the polymer to form directly in the continuous phase and by this create the polymer material. So once you start simply, you, you shear away your, your uh, monomer phase or you kind of try to convince the monomer to form a polymer in the water phase. Okay, and I want to start with a procedure which is probably the most widely used and most important one, which is known as emulsion polymerization. Now here the principle is that we exploit the limited solubility of some monomer. So we start with a two-phase system. Okay? And I'm underlining this limited solubility because, as we will see, this is important. So in a sense, just as examples, maybe, you can directly write this here, or very typically, this is used to make polystyrene or to make polymethyl methacrylate. And those would be the monomers. Methyl And especially this methyl methacrylate is actually industrially very relevant. This is the process, or what I will introduce to you, is the process on how we make plexiglass. And plexiglass, probably uh, most of you know this, is a polymeric glass that you find in airplane windows, in whatever, the hockey stadium, in shields for um, sports glasses, helmets, and so on and so forth. So transparent plastic glass is 
synthesized or industrially fabricated by this process. Okay, so why is it important to exploit this limited stability? So if the monomer is soluble in the water phase, in the continuous phase, then of course um, it will just, it will like to be there. So there's nothing we can do if we start to polymerize, then we form polymers that are soluble in, in the water phase. However, if the monomer does not like to be in the water phase, then we need to try to convince it to feel more comfortable in the water phase. And in order to do this, we need to have some monomers that can actually be in the water phase and diffuse from our monomer phase to wherever we want to have them. Okay, so the key idea is to increase or to find a spot where such monomers that are hydrophobic feel at home in the water phase. And what we do here is we use surfactants. Let me call this help solib sol solubilize hydrophobic monomers. Okay, what do I mean by this? If we have a surfactant, and most of you will know that a surfactant molecule will look something like this, hydrophobic head group, hydro, hydrophilic head group, hydrophobic tail, and if we get, give this in water and as a side note, we, we are above the CMC, the critical micelle concentration, then we form micelles. Something like this. So this is a micelle. And the micelle forms because all the hydrophilic head groups will point to the water phase and all the hydrophobic tails will stay among themselves. And this now means that within our water phase, we now have very small local hydrophobic regions. So a micelle is the diameter depending on the molecule you use is approximately, let's say, 5 to 10 nanometers in size, so really very small, and it has it creates a hydrophobic local environment. So now if we have monomers that do not like the water phase but ha have a limited solubility in it, they may find this region here very attractive because if they're hydrophobic, they would of course like to be surrounded by, hydro by a hydrophobic environment. And this is exactly what we exploit in this emulsion polymerization process. Okay, so let's um, directly jump in to our process and take these requirements into account. So what we start with is we have a two-phase system, water as a continuous phase, and then let's say styrene or whatever, or MMA as a monomer phase. And then we steer a little bit in order to create really big droplets of these emulsions. This is why, or of these monomer phases. This is why this process is known as emulsion polymerization. So we have a really big monomer droplet in a continuous, so here this is the monomer, and this is surrounded by water. And in this water phase, we already have our surfactants in a concentration above the critical micelle concentration, so there will be micelles. 
Good. And now we said that our monomer has a limited water solubility. So there's an equilibrium with been a lot of monomers in the monomer phase and a few monomers in the water phase. That's the limited solubility, and this is important. So now, whenever we have a monomer that is in this water phase, well, then it diffuses around, but it would still much, feel much more comfortable, or its chemical potential would be much lower in a hydrophobic environment. So every now and then, it will find a micelle, and then enters. So the monomer, this is the phase, and let's write down, where do we do this? Maybe I clear this up here. To make space for some comments here. So in the beginning, we have my cells and we have monomer droplets. So now a monomer will diffuse into the my cell and this has a few consequences. A, the micelle will become a little bit bigger because now there is more um, material in it. But secondly, if we remove the monomers here and everything is in equilibrium, then we will get more diffusion of more monomer into the water phase to re-establish uh, re the equilibrium concentration. So we have... Monomers enter the micelle. And new monomer um, enters the water phase. So in effect, what we get is a diffusion of monomer from droplet to the micelle. Right? So it enters here. And because it enters here, it will come out here, and this will then go on and on. But now, eventually, the micelles, there is some monomer in the micelles, and the reaction, or well, nothing else happens. But we also have an initiator here. And this initiator, I, decomposes and forms a radical. And this radical can enter a micelle. Now, it just goes around, finds a micelle, sees the monomers there, starts to react. And that means that the micelle polymerizes. Now we have a polymer in here. So we have an initiation from the water phase. And the initiator enters the micelles. Now, if this happens, we suddenly don't have any monomer here in the micelles because the initiator will certainly, in such a small compartment, polymerize all monomers that it finds. You know, it's a little bit like, like a wolf or a fox that enters um, a huge barn full of chicken. 
So this will all be consumed. And as a consequence, more monomer that is, again, dissolved in the water phase will re-enter the micelles. And that means that more monomer will diffuse out of the monomer droplets. So first, I mean, we have a polymerization. And then five, we get additional diffusion. of monomer into the micelles. And this is how the polymer, the micelle then swells more and more, then more initiator enters, then it, uh, it polymerizes more, then more monomer enters, then the initiator polymerizes more, and so on and so forth. And at the end of the day, you have a big polymer particle that contains, and this is important, a lot of polymer chains. It's not a single polymer chain, but there's a lot of polymer chains in there. And of course, there is still surfactant outside, and this is important as we discussed because it prevents coalescence. So this here then leads to the growth of the particles. And this is how we do an emulsion polymerization. So let's look at this on the screen. So again, here you see exactly these things. And you see, again, the whole mechanism, what is happening. So we get an initiation or a diffusion into the micelles. We initiate. It forms a polymer. More monomer enters. And then it becomes bigger and bigger. OK? And now, of course, the reaction ends once there's either no monomer left or no initiator left. Okay, this is then the end of the game. And the important thing is that everything here is diffusion driven. So we always need to have monomer coming out of the monomer droplets, entering the micelles. That's the, uh, the um, well, the driving force, if you want, of this polymerization. And now if you make your particles and you look at them, or you take them from your dispersion, you put the droplet onto a substrate, and then you look at it in electron microscope, then you see that you get First of all, a lot of particles, and they are extremely monodispersed and uh, uniform in size. Now you see sometimes you have a small one like here, or a bigger one like here, but all in all, they come out extremely beautiful and monodispersed. And this is why somebody like me that does a lot of self-assembly very much likes this process. Okay, and you see the typical size is something between, let's say, 50 to 500 or to a micrometer, so it's very small particles, which is good for us because we want to do surface nanostructures. Okay, it's also good for a paint because you don't want them to settle, and if they're small enough, then they remain in a dispersed state, and gravity is not strong enough to um, sink them. Okay, just as a very quick recap, and this is maybe something you can go through um, at home and try to understand why or how to answer these questions, and of course we can discuss them then in our Zoom meeting in more detail. So important for you to understand is how many phases do we need in the beginning to make this process, why we need to add a surfactant, where we need to initiate in order for it to work, and then, and this is an important question here, how come that the polymerization really occurs in the micelles and not in the monomer droplets? And a little hint, this depends on the relative size of the monomer droplet to the micelles. So think about what this changes or which property changes when you make a material smaller and smaller. Then we can also discuss why monodispersed uh, mono particles results, how we can tailor the size distribution, and what kind of polymers we can synthesize. So now, having seen how all this works out in theory and on, on uh, chalkboard and paper, let's go to the lab and see how an emulsion polymerization works in real life. So Julia will tell you or will show you how we do in our lab, how we do a normal emulsion polymerization. So enjoy and see you in a bit. Hi, I'm Julia. I'm a postdoc in the Vogel Group. And today I'm going to show you how we prepare monodispersed polystyrene particles. The setup that we need is composed of a heating plate equipped with an oil bath 
um, a round bottom flask with a stirrer and two uh, septums, a cooler and some nitrogen supplies. The reagents that we are gonna need are uh, 240 milliliters of um, distilled water, 10 grams of styrene, 100 milligrams of acrylic acid dissolved in five milliliters of water, and 100 milligrams of ammonium persulfate dissolved in five milliliters of water. So the first step is to add uh, the water to the um, flask. Now we are going to flush nitrogen into the water um, for 30 minutes while heating up the solution to the temperature at which we want to perform the reaction, which is 80 degrees. Uh, and at the same time, we are going to steer the reaction. And it's important to see uh, a nice vortex forming. Now we waited 30 minutes and we are going to inject the styrene directly into the water. Now 10 minutes passed and I'm gonna inject the acrylic acid. Five minutes pass and now we are gonna inject the initiator. As you can see, the solution first turns blue and then white again while the particles continue to grow. Twenty-four hours passed and now we can cool down the reaction. Now the reaction is cold and we can filter it. By putting a droplet um, of the particles over a piece of silicone and letting it dry, we can get a nice colorful coffee ring due to the structural color of order assembly of the particles. Okay, so this is the first process and let's look at the second process. And the second process, let me go back to the blackboard. The second process is known as mini emulsion and here you see the importance is this mini emulsion mini polymerization so this is conceptually even simpler the principle here is We make very small droplets and then we polymerize. And then we have polymer particles. And then and then polymerize. Of course. The devil is in the details, and the trick here, or the, the complexity is, to actually make very small droplets. Because we know that surfaces or interfaces cost energy. Now, molecules are always have a higher energy at an interface compared to in the bulk or in the volume. So the smaller you make your particles, 
the larger the entire surface area. And this, in turn, then means that you need to put forward a lot of energy to make these small, um, these small particles. Okay? And in addition, we need to take care about the stability. And that's something that I will come to because this is really the biggest challenge. But if we overcome this challenge, then we get a very good gimmick. And that is, let me just write this down here, typical monomers. We get access to polymer particles in a really, really big variety. Because we can certainly make an emulsion that is an oil or monomer in water emulsion. So hydrophobic monomers. can be used, which are a lot of monomers that we use for polymerization. But we can also make an oil and, and water in oil emulsion. So we can use hydrophilic monomers and dissolve them in a little bit of water and then make droplets in a continuous oil phase. And this means that we can also make hydrophilic monomers. Or we can make, to be precise, we can make particles or nanoparticles from hydrophilic monomers, so hydrophilic polymer particles. And we can also, and I'll show this to you in a second, we can use preform polymers that we can do however we want this with all our sophisticated techniques that we discussed. We can dissolve them in a solvent and then we can use this to make an emulsion. And then we simply evaporate the solvent and then we have polymer particles. So we can also use preformed polymers. So this means we have a really, really big variety of materials. And this is really the strength of mini emulsion polymerization. So now where's the catch? And the catch is that there is a few challenges. We already said it, it consumes energy because we need to make small droplets, but we also need to consider um, stability issues. So the stability of the emulsion. So look at, uh, let's look at this. How does an emulsion degrade? Well, first, of course, we can have two droplets. When they come close, then they coalesce. So droplet one, droplet two, if they attract each other, then they will get in contact. And since they are liquid, they will directly coalesce into a bigger droplet. Now here we already know the solution. Now this is exactly what we discussed before to how to make particles stable as well. We need to prevent them from coming into contact. Now how do we do this? Remember from a few minutes ago, what we need to do is add surfactants. So now with the surfactant, we have charges or maybe polymers on the surface. This prevents the particles from getting in contact and they will not coalesce anymore. But now there's also a second problem or a second mechanism how an emulsion can degrade. And this is known as Oswald ripening. So for those of you that, that have a background in material science. They probably know this from metal alloys and so on. But generally, what is Oswald ripening? Oswald ripening means that small particles uh, dissolve and large particles grow at the expense of small particles. So if you have small particles and larger particles, and this is something that we cannot avoid because 
in, in our system, if we share or whatever make a small emulsion, they will never have exactly the same uh, size. No, they can be somewhat similar in dimensions, but they will always be smaller ones and always be slightly larger ones. So if you have something like this, then the smaller ones or the larger ones will grow at the expense of smaller ones. So the smaller ones get smaller and the bigger ones get bigger. That's a little bit like in a capitalistic society. The rich ones get richer and the poor ones get poorer. It's almost like a law of nature and there's somewhat kind of uh, our Oswald ripening here. Eventually the small one will disappear and the large ones will become larger and larger. And why is that? So the driving force here is the so-called, let's make some space here, Laplace pressure. Delta P is 2 gamma, which is the surface tension, over R. And R is the radius of the particle. So here is radius. And gamma is the surface tension. So this means that smaller particles have a higher pressure or a higher vapor pressure. And if you have a higher pressure, then you have a higher tendency to evaporate. That's also not something I want to go into great detail here. You know, it's maybe easiest to picture really in liquid droplets in a gas where they can ev evaporate. But generally, smaller units, smaller droplets will always have a higher tendency to lose monomer or lose components. And if you, um, if you want to learn more about this, again, maybe look into these uh, Grenzflächen in der Verfahrenstechnik, call it an interface lecture of myself, where we discuss these Laplace pressure and, and curved interfaces in much more detail. So this is uh, here. Uh, it should be sufficient to say that there is a difference in Laplace pressure. This difference causes Oswald ripening. And Oswald ripening means that these small particles, because of the higher pressure, will always become smaller. And the larger particles, so if you want, there's diffusion of monomer from here to here. Right? The large particles become bigger and bigger. So now, what to do about this? If you don't change this, then you make your emulsion. And before, next time you know, the, the droplets will go bigger and bigger. And then... Uh, that's it. Now then you have eventually one really big droplet. So what you can do here is you need to counteract. We counteract our osmotic pressure similar to the surfactant that we add, introduce an electric static force, and this counteracts our van der Waals forces. So we cannot change the van der Waals forces, we just need to do something that acts in a different direction. And here, we use osmotic pressure. To counteract. Okay, how does this work? Let's say we have two particles again, and a smaller, like a, maybe a smaller one, and a bigger one. And these two particles, now we, we add something, which is a little dot here, like two of them. And these dots are, is a, a substance, a molecule, that is the least water soluble of everything in the system. So what we define is that these small molecules that we dissolve in our monomer cannot, they will not be able to go into the water phase because they are too insoluble. And since we make our emulsion from a really big monomer unit and then we shear it down, the concentration here and here will be equal. So C, concentration of this osmotic pressure agent here, C is small, is equal C big. Okay, so now Oswald ripening sets in. Again, Oswald ripening tells us that the small particles will get smaller and the large particles will get larger. So the small particle will get smaller and the large particle will get bigger. Now since only monomer diffuses from here to here, suddenly the concentration is not the same anymore. So here, C small will now be bigger than the concentration here. Well, because this one has lost monomer, but it contained, or it retained its material, 
it's an osmotic pressure agent. This one has gained monomer and it didn't change. That, that means that the particle now has a smaller, the small particle has a higher concentration. And if you have a system where you have two uh, well, compartments that are in contact because the monomer can diffuse and there is um, a difference in concentration, then osmosis sets in and tries to equilibrate or to, to equalize this concentration gradient. And this osmotic pressure now leads to diffusion of monomer from here to here. And in sum, you find an equilibrium as these two effects cancel each other out. And this is what you need to do to form a minimization polymerization. Okay, so now let's look at how this works. So here again you see coalescence and that we can use stabilizer to prevent decoalescence. Here you see Oswald ripening from um, Oswald who actually, actually got the Nobel Prize one year before Van der Waals, so no, similar kind of concept. You see the uh, Laplace pressure, you see the growth of the particles, and then you see exactly what I just had on the blackboard. Because of osmosis, you, you prevent this, or you form an equilibrium here because of this concentration difference. So now we can put everything together and make our mini emulsion polymerization. And once we know what to do, it's actually fairly easy. We take our monomer phase, which is now the, the, red one, uh, the yellow one here, and we need to make sure that we, that we uh, tick off the stability criteria. First, we add into our water phase, we add surfactant. This will prevent coalescence. Secondly, we add this ultra-hydrophobe or hydrophobic agent or osmotic pressure agent, this molecule that doesn't dissolve or doesn't um, diffuse into the water phase. That's this one here. And then we add an initiator because we want to not make monomer droplets, we want to make polymer droplets. Then we have all of this, we put it together. Then we use very high energy input. Typically one uses an either a high pressure homogenization or ultrasound, so something that really provides a lot of energy. And then we form these small droplets composed of monomer and initiator and this hydrophobic agent. And then we heat up or shine light or whatever to decompose the initiator. This in introduces a polymerization. And then we end up having our polymer nanoparticles that say contain this ultra hydrophobe, but the polymer nanoparticles are now directly dispersed in the continuous phase. So what we essentially do is really a free radical polymerization just on a very small scale. Okay, so here you see these different steps. And just as a quick example, here are um, a few particles that have been prepared by this technique. And if you look at the figure caption, this is polyacrylonitrile and polyisoprenato uh, uh, nanoparticles obtained by radical polymerization. This and this, so different monomers. Then we have polyacrylamide particles obtained in inverse mini emulsion. So these are hydrophilic polymer particles. Then we have polybutyl cyanacrylate nanoparticles. They were made by anionic polymerization. So this, is this one here. And then we have PLLA particles. So this is a biodegradable material obtained by the solvent evaporation technique. And this is something I want to briefly show you as well. So this is this solvent evaporation technique. That's probably one of the simplest process to process polymers into nanoparticles. You take a polymer that you have and you dissolve it in a solvent. Now the only trick may be to find a good solvent for the polymer. But if you have this, then you do exactly the same. You add surfactant, you make an, a mini emulsion, so you shield it, then you have your dispersion of polymer particles in a solvent dispersed in water. Then you increase the temperature so the solvent evaporates and then you're left with your polymer nanoparticles. Okay, so this is, makes it even more versatile because you can preform your polymers as you like. So again here, I would like to invite you to recap um, what you have understood and maybe what you have not understood about mini emulsion polymerization, which is then something we can discuss in our Zoom meeting. So what are the role of the individual components? What do we need the components for? Why do we need this high energy input to actually form a mini emulsion? Then it is known that the amount of surfactant controls the size of the particles. And now think about why that is. If you add more surfactant, you get smaller particles. Why? So what is so versatile about the process? So how do you run it in direct emulsion? How do you run it in an inverse emulsion? 
and so on. And yeah, exactly how we can we process hydrophilic monomers. Now, what do we need to consider there? Okay, so just some more tricks that we can play with a mini emulsion. First, we can not only add polymers or whatever to our material, but we can also add other additives. And here you see an example where, we, where um, the cook here, this is Katharina Landfester, added magnetite particles, so small magnetic iron oxide particles to the mini emulsion. And then you get composite nanoparticles that have uh, contain polymer and magnetic particles. And this, for example, could be a good contrast agent for MRI imaging. Well, then you can encapsulate dyes. And if you can encapsulate dyes, fluorescent dyes, you can, for example, probe how or whether and how efficiently nanoparticles enter cells. So this is, of course, important to all these biomedical applications that we discussed in the beginning. So here you see different particles with different dyes. Some go through the cell walls. These are the red ones. And some are um, internalized into the cells, which are the ones that have the green dye. So this is extremely useful, extremely important to understand these interactions of particles, nanoparticles, and cells. Well, then you can introduce, for example, diazo components, which we know release nitrogen when you heat them up. And this can then make what is known as nano explosives. So here you can destroy your capsule on demand. This is one way to rupture these capsules and maybe release a payload. You can add metal nanoparticles or metal complexes. And then if you arrange your particles and you burn away the, part uh, the polymer component, you end up having nanoparticle arrays. So that means you can make really, really small metal nanoparticles in a very ordered fashion. This, by the way, is something I did in my PhD thesis with Katharina Landfester. And then you can play some more uh, tricks. You can, for example, make what is known as Janus particles. So here you see these particles contain two different materials at the same time. Oh, you see this here fairly well. Or you can make nano capsules where you have hollow shells with a liquid inside. And this is something I will tell you in a second how to make this. So let's briefly summarize these synthetic aspects. Mini emulsion polymerization is really versatile, allows encapsulation of complex structures, and we need to fi fight coalescence and Oswald ripening. And at the, at, uh, as a disadvantage, especially kind of for large scale industrial applications, you really need to um, put in a lot of energy to make these small particles. And emulsion polymerization is, in contrast, has a much more limited choice of monomers because you need to gamble on this um, limited solubility in water. But if you find a monomer that works, you get very monodispersed particles and it, you don't require any, any energy input. The whole process works by itself because it's driven by the diffusion. So you don't really need to provide the energy to compartmentalize these situations. So now, again, we have seen how this mini emulsion polymerization works out on paper or on the screen. But now I want to um, invite you to join me in the lab. And Herbert, my PhD student, will show you how we do in our lab a mini emulsion with solvent evaporation technique on a, for a lab scale, relatively large amount of polymer particles. So enjoy, enjoy. See you in a bit. And Herbert will show you how to do this. Hello and welcome to another episode of Science with me, Herbert. In today's episode, I want to talk a little bit about how to formulate nanoparticles from polymers. Polymers can be usually obtained as, for example, like granulates or as a powder material. However, in some applications, especially like for the pharmaceutical industry, it might be interesting that we formulate them into a nanoparticle dispersion. And today's process will be exactly for that, a simple approach towards nanoparticle formulation, the mini emulsion with solvent evaporation technique. For this recipe, you need an organic solvent, a polymer of your choice, preferably a hydrophobic one, water, and a surfactant. In the first stage, we're turning on our heating plates and introduce a gentle stirring 
Then we add to our aqueous phase basically our surfactant. After we have added our surfactant, we're also adding our polymer to our organic phase. A few minutes have passed and as you can see now here, both of our solutions, our organic phase with the polymer and our surfactant has basically turned into a clear solution. Now, I will be adding the water with the surfactant to our organic phase. What we should see is basically that our system will be forming two phases. We see here basically a lower phase where we have still our organic solvent and the higher phase with our um, aqueous phase. And what we will be doing now is we basically pre-emulsify those two immiscible liquids to form large droplets. Now we have obtained a stable pre-emulsion as we can see here, it's white and we have basically droplets of our organic solvent with our polymer in an aqueous phase and in the next step we even want to decrease the size of these droplets further and we have basically nanoparticles in the end of the day. This we will be doing with the so-called ultra-turax stirring. The ultra-thorax stirring, the mechanism for the droplets basically to make them smaller relies on this tool. It's a so-called rotor-stator system where we have an outer basically ring and an inner ring. The inner ring, the rotor is spinning and within this narrow gap basically the droplets are processed, they are sheared and become even smaller. After a few cycles of the ultra thorax steering, we are basically done. We have obtained our nano emulsion, which we are now evaporating from that, the inner phase, our organic solvent. And what we will end up after a night basically with is basically a dispersion of our nanoparticles. This is basically everything on today's one-on-one -on, -one on the mini emulsion with solvent evaporation process. My name is Herbert and I thank you a lot for tuning in in this week's episode and I hope that I can welcome you to next week's episode also. Have a good night. Okay, so welcome back. Now you have seen how this actually looks like in real life. And now I want to continue very shortly with two types of spec special architectures. One is this nanocapsules and in order to synthesize nanocapsules we need to go back into a very early consideration. So the idea is that we need to play with the interface and use the interface as a template for the polymerization. Because if we manage to do this we form the polymer only at the phase boundary and this by definition will give us a capsule. And we recall from this very classic example of nylon production that if you have two different components that are soluble in water, the, in this case the di uh, diamine, and in an organic solvent, like this long chain dichloride, then we can form nylon or polyamides at the interface. Now remember the video that I showed you um, from Salvatore in the very beginning. Now we can exploit exactly the same strategy to make nanoscale polymer capsules. Now in this case, instead of using a flat interface here, we make our emulsion that contains the very first monomer in the water phase and then we add the second monomer in the continuous phase. And then we do this, they can only meet at the interface, that's what you see here, and then form a polymer capsule. So here, let's say this is monomer A, these dashes here, they are already in a preformed mini emulsion. Now we add the second monomer over there in light blue and then the reaction will occur exclusively at the interface.
And that's of course very handy because you can encapsulate functional components. You now you can play around with uh, drug delivery, release of payloads. You can think about these perfume strips and so on and so forth. Okay, and you can also understand that depending on how much monomer you put in here, you can control the thickness of your nanocapsules. And again, this is how they look like. You just saw, uh, saw the picture. Very clearly, you have a rim, which is the polymer, and an empty kind of hollow shell, which is the compartment. Okay, what else can we do? Here's some more tricks. Core shell particles and genus particles. And here, we need to capitalize on a different effect. So we already uh, know from a few lectures ago that polymers do not like, like to mix. And now imagine you make a mini emulsion system or an emulsion system very generally where you have a solvent and in this solvent, in this very small confined space, you add two different types of polymers. Let's say a red one and a blue one. And then something I would like to show you maybe on the blackboard. So you have your compartment here containing a solvent and an outer face here, let's say water, and then we have polymer A and polymer B in here. And we already know that when we remove the solvent, the polymers do not like to, like to mix. And now we can exploit this, we remove the solvent. And there's now two options. Either one polymer likes to be more in contact with water than the other polymer. So let's say this is B and this is A. So then we can form something that will look like this. So a core shell structure. And this will form if the interfacial energy of this one with water is smaller than the interfacial energy with this one. Because the system, of course, wants to minimize its total energy and then it puts the material with the lower interfacial energy to the outside to save this expensive A um, water interface. But if the, the interfacial energies are approximately the same, then there is no energy to be gained from putting one polymer to the outside and the other one to the inside. And now what the system wants to do is to minimize the contact between the two phases. Because if they don't like to mix with each other, then the interfacial energy will be relatively high. So the system will try to minimize these unfavorable contacts. And how will this look like? Well, the minimum amount of contact area is if one particle of one polymer goes to one side and the other one will go to this side. And this is what is known as a genus particle. Genus comes from the Roman god genus that has two faces and this particle here also has, if you want, two faces depending from which side you look at it. Okay, so you see by combining um, Concepts that we learned about before, this uh, uh, point that polymers do not mix so well, we can really exploit this to make very complex structures. And now, of course, you can make 
this particle is even more complex if instead of using two normal polymers, you use plot copolymers because now the particles are not even able to completely separate because they are chained together. And this makes it even more complicated. And then I just show, you, show to you what we can do here. So this is kind of what we see. And you see an example of such a genus particle here. And now if you use plot copolymers, you see that you can either make what is known as onion type particles, so really stripes, alternating stripes, or you can make much more complex particles. No, this is from Andre Kreschel, a friend of mine, that, has, that have these beautiful, if you want, football-like um, structures where really this phase separation and confinement plays out in a certain way that you can form very complex structures. Okay, so in the last few minutes, I want to discuss one additional aspect with you, and that is the kinetics of the, mini, of the emulsion polymerization. So now we kind of switch gears a little bit and look into um, chemical engineering aspects. And I will just clear up again. Oops. So before we do this, let's have a quick recap. So if we look at free radical polymerization, we devised a strategy on how we can express the rate of polymerization and the degree of polymerization. And how did we do this? We considered the three reaction steps, initiation, propagation, and termination. And then we put up our kinetic equations for all these three steps. So we had the formation of radicals, we had the conversion of monomer, and we had the termination of radicals, and um, tried to connect them to get an expression. And then we realized that we need to do another trick in order to remove this concentration of, M of radicals. And this, this trick that we applied was this steady state principle that the formation and termination of radicals is over the entire or the largest part of the reactions is equally fast and in a steady state. So the radical concentration is the same. And then we put all these equations together. If you don't remember, just check again in the, in the chapter on radical polymerization. This is what came out. RP, the rate of polymerization, is proportional to the monomer concentration, which we knew is a very dangerous uh, situation here, because if you want to increase the monomers to speed up your reaction because of the Tromstoff effect, your reaction vessel may explode. And it's also proportional to the concentration of initiator to the power of one half. And now the degree of polymerization you saw is proportional to the rate of uh, the concentration of initiator to the power of minus one half. And this led us to this radical dilemma that RP, if you increase initiator, the reaction rate goes up, but your molecular weight goes down. And that's bad. No, because ideally you want to have large polymers and fast. So now let's see what happens in an emulsion polymerization. So to like, simplify this a little bit, what we assume is that the polymerization occurs only in the micelles. And as I said, or as I already asked you to think about, there's very good reasons for that, why this will occur in the micelles. Maybe just to spill the beans now, if you have thought about it earlier. Um, this is because we have a much larger area of micelles compared to monomer droplets because the micelles are so small. And of course, the smaller something gets, the larger the surface to volume ratio. And this means that it's much more likely for an initiator to actually enter a micelle or to find a micelle when it diffuses around and not a monomer droplet. Okay, then we assume that the polymerization is induced by one radical entering the micelle. And because the micelles are very small, we say that if a second radical enters, it will instantly connect with the first radical and terminate the reaction. And that's also a very reasonable assumption. And finally, we say that the radicals cannot leave the micelles, and instead they will propagate and eventually terminate. And also this makes sense, because once the radical enters a micelle, it will find a lot of monomers, so it will like to polymerize, and everything is in a very closed space. And as it polymerizes, it becomes more and more hydrophobic, 
because it adds hydrophobic monomers. So it will, will become increasingly unlikely for the radical to go out into the water phase again because it doesn't really dissolve anymore. So all these um, steps are fairly reasonable. So now what does this mean? This boils down to this very simple picture that we have our micelle here. There's monomers in here. We have a radical that will enter. If, it's, if it enters, it will form a polymer. This polymer, what is radical polymer, cannot go out. And a new radical that enters will terminate the reaction. OK, so this is what I just said, or what we had on the blackboard in very simple pictures. So polymer cannot go out, radicals enter. And whenever a radical enters, it either induces a polymer or it stops a polymer. OK, so now using this concept, we can very, very easily derive an expression for the concentration of radicals. And before we do this, let me just briefly recall that the rate of polymerization, Rp, was derived by us as dm over dt. And this was Kp times times monomer concentration and times radical concentration. And if you don't really follow anymore, this is from chapter four. And now we had to do this kind of extra work because we don't really know the concentration of radicals. And this is why we came up with the steady state so that we can express the, uh, the expression of radicals via this balance between uh, termination and initiation. But now it's actually very simple. We, we can directly deduce the numbers of free radicals or of currently polymerizing monomers, if you want, using this concept here. And what we can assume is that either an emulsion, it's a very binary system. So either there is one radical in the micelle, which is this scenario, or if a second radical enters, it instantly becomes zero. Because the micelles are so small that two radicals will never coexist. And this makes it, of course, very easy and very binary. That means if we know the numbers of particles, we can express the numbers of, or the concentration of radicals. So NP is the numbers of total micelles. And on average, every second micelle contains a radical, no, because it's either 1 or 0. And of course, an average is 0. And now, because this is a molar quantity, and this is um, uh, a number quantity, we need to divide by Avogadro's constant to get quantitative numbers, no, because this is in moles, and this is not in moles. This is in absolute numbers. OK, but this now means that we can express the rate of polymerization extremely easily. This is now Kp, that's this one, divided by Na, it's just a number, times the numbers of monomers, times 
and p, the number of my cells, divided by 2. And this makes it very simple to calculate or to control the rate of polymerization simply by changing the numbers of my cells. And how do I change the numbers of my cells? By adding more or less surfactant. And now to make things even more beautiful, and this is something that I will just show you on the blackboard, uh, on the slides here. So this is the rate of polymerization. And now the degree of polymerization is also something that we calculated in chapter 4 as the rate of addition of monomer to a chain divided by the rate of initiation. So how fast does the chain propagate before it terminates? And now you see that the rate of initiation directly gives you this one here, and the rate of propagation doesn't contain this concentration of monomer uh, radicals anymore, but it's simply the rate of um, my cells. So now you see from these very simple considerations that in an emulsion polymerization, we get both the rate of polymerization that is proportional to the numbers of my cells, and the degree of polymerization is also proportional to the numbers of my cells. So now suddenly, by nature of this very confined polymerization technique, you resolve this radical dilemma and you can have both. You can have long polymers and high turnover, high speed of reaction, and you simply control this by changing the numbers of surfactant. And this, of course, makes it extremely attractive for the chemical industry, and this is, for example, why um, plexiglass uh, polymethylmethacolate is indeed polymerized using this emulsion polymerization. Okay, so no radical dilemma in emulsion polymerization. Okay, very nice. So with this, we're at the, um, well, yeah, almost at the end of the lecture. I just wanted to briefly summarize these advantages of um, emulsion polymerization. So you can have this fast reaction that still gives you high um, decrease of polymerization. You do not need to worry about viscosity because normally if you form polymers, it will become more and more viscous. Here you have water as the continuous phase, so the viscosity doesn't, doesn't change or doesn't change dramatically at least. You have this heat transfer, so you don't need to worry about Tromstoff effect. And you use water as the main component, so it's also environmentally friendly. You don't need a solvent, right? And as we discussed in the beginning, a lot of the products can directly be used as they come out of the factory. So this is really an attractive process from a very applied aspect as well. And you see it's also interesting both fundamentally because you have this change in kinetics and for very fundamental research as I showed you for these beautiful particles that you can make and these aspects of surface patterning that you can generate from this. Okay, now we are at the end of the lecture and let, let us briefly summarize. So there's multiple ways of making polymer particles, emulsion polymerization, Mini emulsion polymerization, there's of course, as usual, advantages and disadvantages that we have already discussed. And then we've seen that we can make much more complex structures, such as capsules or core shell particles, genus particles, if we factor in interfacial effects and miscibility or immiscibility effects. And then we discussed chemical engineering aspects, and we saw that heat dissipation is a very good thing and that we have this compensation or that we overcome the radical dilemma because of the difference in polymerization locations, if you want. So with this, I apologize for being um, slightly over time. I hope you enjoyed the lecture nevertheless, and I wish you a good day. Take care and stay healthy. Thank you.